dare say I won't lift up this bag. I won't lift it up because I thank God He freed me. I don't have I don't have these bricks in my life and, and a bag full of bricks that I bring to the table. Uh, thank God for that. Don't you thank God for that, baby? I thank God for it. I don't have that kind of. And so. Uh, he, he said some powerful things, and, yeah, and uh, yeah. we have to take heed to uh, learn how to um, put those things into, he said, practice, application. Um, listen, whether you want to forgive somebody or not, mm -hmm. as a born-again believer, as a Christian, right. as a son and a daughter of the Most High God, it is your responsibility. It is your duty. Mm -hmm. It is your obligation. Amen. to forgive Amen. because if Amen. you don't forgive guess what when you yeah, face them because you're going to face them by yourself it ain't going to be you ain't going to have your wife and your children and your family with you or none of the church members with you your pastor can't go with you mm -hmm. i'm not going with nobody on this trip i'm sorry baby it's me and him it's, that's who it is mm -hmm. but when i face him yeah he's going to look at me yes, Lord. and see that i did what he said do which he told me I have to forgive. Now, Jesus gave us that example of, of forgiving seven times 70. So what that's saying is, if somebody has offended you 149 times in a day, which I don't believe they do, in a 24 hour period, because you sleep in about eight of the miles, uh -huh. so you can't make up no excuse. You can't lie and say, well, they said so, so they didn't. You have to forgive them. Because yes. that's seven times 70. That's 149. Folk, I don't believe people offend you that much during the course of the day. No. But if they offend you one time, and he told us that in order for you to understand forgiveness, what? You first of all have to be offended. That's right. Offenses come, and then comes forgiveness. This is how we know how to forgive people yeah. is when we have been hurt. Yeah. We have been offended. Some of you in here might have been offended. Just this week, it's Friday. Somebody might have said something to you ill, <coughs> something to you out of the way. Somebody might have done something to you. Some of y'all might be holding something 15 years ago because boo-boo didn't need that five dollars back. It offended you. You loaned it out of goodwill. You loaned it because you wanted to help him. Yes. Uh-huh. 490. Oh, my bus. So that's that's even more, ain't it? Thank you. That's a bad petition. Thank you. That's even better. So now we got to say, you know, when people offend us, you got to forgive them. Even Amen. if they offend you one time. That's right. You got to forgive them. You, if you hold on to it, what John is trying to explain to us is that you're going to be, you're going to be, you're going to be adding bricks. Because what's going to happen is you don't talk to the Lord about it. You don't get it off your chest, off your heart. That's right. What's going to happen is it's going to build yeah. up. Uh -huh. Yes, yeah. to give to somebody. Yes, this is why people are sick. Yes, and when they go to the doctors, and the doctors tell nothing. them, when the doctor diagnoses them and say, we can't find anything wrong with you, a lot of it might be unforgiveness, mm -hmm. that you haven't forgiven nobody. I mean, you, you're holding something, you're carrying this weight, you're carrying this extra burden, and you don't have to because, as Elder said, Jesus took that on the cross when that yeah. price was paid with his blood. Yes. And so, yeah, we were brought for the price. Yeah. And so because he's paid that price, now if he could say, because when he did mention these words and say it is finished, and he asked the Father to forgive us, yeah. he was talking to those people, but guess what? He was talking to generations. Amen. He was talking to us too, even though we won't dare mm -hmm. in the physical, we were dead because he died for us too. Yeah. So he was saying, forgive them, for they do not understand what they're doing either. Mm -hmm. Father, forgive them. And so if you're holding something against somebody tonight, you need to think about it. I'm just asking you to think about it. I'm asking you to think about why are you, why are you holding this against somebody? And this was 10 years ago. Maybe your father didn't do you right, or your mother didn't do you right, or somebody didn't do right by you, or maybe somebody, maybe a loved one, a spouse, maybe... Uh, you might be divorced and, and somebody hurt you in the past and you say, why are you still holding on to that mess if, if you're a believer? If you're born again Christian, mm -hmm. you should have moved on because you should have repented of your sins. Mm -hmm. God forgave you. He's still forgiving you. 
and you still have to repent every day. And guess what? When you repent, forgiveness comes with that. And so on tonight, um, you've heard about the love of God. You've heard about the forgiveness of God. And see, we're just giving y'all sound bites. This ain't no, you know, giving you like 15 minutes. We're giving you sound bites. This is not the lessons that we could really kind of, we could teach on this stuff until Jesus comes back. But we're giving you something to think about because we want you to reconcile your indifferences. So now I'm up now. Amen. My peace has come. And my peace is going to be a little different because most people think when you talk about reconciliation, you're talking about restoration and you're putting back together things. Mm -hmm. I want to talk about the nature of it tonight, mm -hmm. the nature of reconciliation. I want to show you how God reconciled you to himself mm -hmm. and how it all started. And it has to do with you being a sinner, Amen. saved by grace. Amen. Now, I want to show you how the nature of it takes place. Because first and foremost, don't you know that the sin nature is hereditary? All right. It's something that you inherited. Mm -hmm. You see, well, I was going to inherit it, Pastor. It was it's something that you was born with. I can't explain it. I can't tell you why we we're born into sin. I can tell you that it starts with our um, our parents, our our first parents of humanity. It started with Adam and Eve. It started from the fall. That's right. And we inherited their disobedience and their deceit. It started in the fall. Mm -hmm. That's where it started from. So every baby that's been born around the world right now is born a sinner. Yeah. They don't know that they are a sinner. They don't even know that they sin. But they're going to grow into it. Mm -hmm. You can raise these children and raise these babies to the best of your ability. But guess what? They still going to lie. They going to steal. They going to do whatever. And I'm not talking about these two babies, but I'm talking about children, period. You know, as parents in here, we raise our children to the best of our abilities because we want them to do better than us. But guess what? It's an hereditary nature in them that will make them do wrong. That's right. Automatically. Because I can tell you right now, you still sin and you still fall short. I don't care how holy you think you are. Mm -hmm. I'm waiting for the amen. amen. I know, mm -hmm. you know, some folk walk around with that, That's with right. that, you know, yeah. I'm holy. You holy what? <laughs> There's only one holy, Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. We are to be holy amen. as he is holy. Amen. We're striving in that lifestyle. Mm -hmm. As as uh, Elder just said, we, we should practice it every day. We should put it into practice. Not just forgiveness, but love. Mm -hmm. And also reconciliation. This is the reason why. And so my part tonight is to deposit in you the nature of reconciliation. How it all started. How it all began. It started with God. And this is why you should reconcile with somebody that you dislike. Now listen, you can dislike people. Let me put this out on the front table. Mm -hmm. You can dislike people, but you are supposed to love them regardless. That's right. I can dislike some of your ways. Mm -hmm. I can dislike some of your opinions and the way you think, your philosophy. If I don't like your philosophy, I can dislike that. That's my business. I can dislike that. Mm -hmm. I can dislike if you wear some, you know, uh, if you wear some real strong, heavy cologne and I just don't like it. Mm -hmm. I don't have to like your cologne. I can dislike it if you don't take care of your hygiene properly. Boy, I dislike it. I can dislike it. I can dislike it. If you just run your mouth all the time and you're not saying nothing to me, you're not making any sense, you're not benefiting me in any way, I can dislike that. But I still have to love you as a person. Amen. I can't discredit that. And so it's always behooving for us as believers regardless of what we think about people or what we dislike about that person or individuals mm -hmm. that we love them Amen. we have patience enough with yeah. them long yeah. suffering that's one of the fruit of the spirits yeah. that you can restore that relationship you shouldn't have no broken relationships as a believer Amen. I'm here to tell you Amen. tonight you shouldn't have a broken relationship Amen. Amen. you should love people 
you should forgive them, and you should try to find some way to restore that relationship. And if they don't want to be in a relationship with you, you've done your part. Mm -hmm. I'll wait for you the eight man to die down as long as you've done your part. Yeah. See, God ain't gonna hold it against you. He's gonna tag them with that. But you still have to do your part. Amen. If you reach out and do your part, then God is pleased with you. If you act like they act, then you've stepped beneath their level of ignorance. Mm -hmm. Yes, you have. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, you don't step up. See, you don't never step to nobody's level of ignorance. I never, I never, it is not a person on this planet that I will step to your level of ignorance. I will not do it. I believe I'm better than that. Mm -hmm. I will not step to your level of ignorance. I will not, I will not fall into it. I, I mean, because I know it when it comes. And so I'm always about being sensitive and trying to reconcile. So let's go, let's go here, this last piece, and then, then we'll have our Q&A time and, and, uh, and, and we'll depart. But uh, I, I, want to, I, I want to get better at this because I want folk, my, my, my whole purpose and my whole premise for this is that people will walk away from here differently. Because I'm hoping and praying that you will be challenged on the night that you will seek the love of God that will make you better. That you will seek his forgiveness that will make you better. And that you will seek reconciliation. So let's talk about the nature of reconciliation real quick. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, there's a verse of scripture here. And in this verse of scripture, it gives us our premise because what I want to talk about is the nature of it. I want to talk about the nature of reconciliation, how it's all come about, how, how God started it, and how he uses it with us today on today. Because, you know, of our sin nature, this is a good place to start instead of just trying to just trying to clean it up and saying, no, oh, y'all, we should just be, we should just always be looking for ways to, to uh, help people and, and, and better our relationships. First and foremost, let me give you a definition of reconciliation or being reconciled. For one thing, it means to change your attitude. It means a changed attitude. That's what reconciliation or reconciliation, it is it is to settle. It is to settle. It is to settle a, a quarrel or it is to settle a dispute. And so if you have if you have someone that you've been arguing with or you have some type of disposition with, you have a dispute with or whatever, as a born again believer, you ought to be able to settle it. Amen. As a believer, listen to what I'm saying when I say this. You don't have to be a genius or a rocket scientist. You don't have to be uh, an accomplished. Um, uh, um, um, you don't have to be uh, successful, uh, wealthy. Uh, you don't have to be academia, uh, an academic, an intelligent person. You need to be able to settle a dispute or a quarrel. Mm -hmm. That's what reconciling is. That's, mm -hmm. that's when you start to learn to reconcile. It's just like uh, being in a court of law and those lawyers have to speak for the persons because those people would probably, if they didn't have a mediator, argue. Mm. You know, that's what us pastors are. You know that I, as pastors, and Pastor Crummy will tell you, and I know that, um, you know, some of the other leadership that's in here that has that, that, that have to deal with people or have, have dealt with couples understand that if there was not a mediator, mm. then they would be at each other. This is one thing that would happen. It would never get to the point because both parties want to be heard. Both parties want to express themselves. And as mediators, we have to settle the disputes. We mm -hmm. have to settle the quarrel. So, so I'm always up for letting somebody speak because we can all sing together right now. We can sing a song and we'll be in harmony. But, mm -hmm. you know, somebody has to listen somebody has to talk. and somebody has to talk in any kind of conversation. And so that's what reconciliation is about. It's, it's, it's about settling, and this is Webster's, it's about um, composure. 
Mm. Uh, yeah, uh, making a difference. It's being consistent. It's being compatible. It's bringing into harmony. <clears throat> it is to make content, people content. Mm -hmm. It is to be submissive and acquiescent. And so reconciliation is reconciling or being reconciled. And so, so it is to restore relationship. It is to, and that's what God has done with us. And so here Paul writes to the Corinthians, y'all know who Paul is, used to be Saul. And this is how God reconciled Saul to become Paul. You all know that Saul of Tarsus was a hitman, a mercenary for the Sanhedrin. Yes. That's what he did. He killed Christians. He was trying his best to destroy the church as a Pharisee, Zealous mm -hmm. Pharisee. He was mm -hmm. he was one of the best at what he did. Brilliant mind. Until that Damascus encounter. God stopped him on the road of Damascus, punished him, knocked him off his high horse. And sometimes that's what has to happen to us Amen. in order to experience God. Yeah. In order to experience his love or his forgiveness, we have to get knocked off our high horse. I'll wait for that to die down Amen. so that you will come to your senses. Because he didn't come to his senses until he met Ananias on Straight Street. God took them scales off his eyes and he changed his name. He changed his position in life. That's what yeah. reconciling is. Yeah. God yeah. took someone that was literally, and I don't yeah. believe nobody in here murdered anybody, but just in case you have, mm -hmm. God will save you too. Yes. Amen. He will serve. Listen, that people, people be thinking that they've done something so bad and they've done something so wrong. God will save you. I don't care what you've done. Amen. I don't care what you've done. I don't care who you are. He will save you. Yes, he will. He will reconcile you to himself. Yes, so, he will. So that's what that's what Webster says, reconciliation. But I want to talk about God's reconciliation. I want to talk about the nature of mm. reconciliation. And, and from that one verse of scripture, Oswald Chambers has said these words. He said, sin is a fundamental relationship. It is not wrong doing but wrong being. Listen to what I'm saying. Oswald Chambers have said these words. Sin is a fundamental relationship. It is not wrong doing. It is wrong being. It is deliberate and determined independence from God. And so here in Romans chapter 6, we see in verse 23, um, this verse of scripture that is very familiar to us. It tells us and it shows us what sin does. It says the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. And so it is, de listen, it is deliberate and determined independence from God. That's what sin is. Y'all know what sin is? It's missing the mark. It's missing the mark. You said, what are you talking about, Pastor? Missing the mark. It, 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 is, it, is, it, is, it is, is deliberately saying to God, I don't need you. It's not breaking the Ten Commandments all by itself, mm -hmm. even though that's missing the mark. His standard, his moral standard for our living. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but what it is is that you saying that I don't need you, God, for nothing. I don't need right. you. I can make it on my own. I can work this life out. I can survive. I can do what I have to do to make a living. I can. I don't need you. I don't need you to wake me up in the morning. I don't need you to put breath into my body. I don't need you to give me the activity of my limbs. I don't need you to make my mind click. You're totally, deliberately independent. You're determined. You don't need them. Mm. That's what missing the mark is. And so, yeah, that's what missing the mark is. It's when you say saying, God, if you don't need him. But this is how loving and how forgiving he is. Watch this. In Romans 6, Paul walks us through steps concerning this process. In Romans chapter 6, and when you look at these verses, when you look at verses um, starting at verse 4, and you look at verses 4 through 7, he, he walks us through this process of how God turned us around to him. And I'm going to give you these few verses, 
Romans 6 verses 4 through 7. And I'm going to read them in your hearing. Let me read them in this, this, this uh, translation. I'll read it better from this NSAP translation. Romans 6. So look at Romans 6. Look at Romans 6. And look at verse. Look at verses uh, 4 through 7. Let's read. It says, Therefore, we are buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in the newness of life. This is God reconciling us through his son, Jesus Christ. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, Certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. Mm. For he who has died has been freed from sin. Look at verse 8, 9 through 11. Now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin, watch this, once for all. That's why you don't have to worry about your sins. That's why you can repent of your sins and ask for forgiveness and he will freely give it to you because he loves you so much. It's over. Paul is saying right here, it is over. And he's really given us his testimony of how God reconciled him yeah. to himself. He goes on to say, for the death that he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. And so we should be living our lives to God, not independent of him, but mm -hmm. dependent solely on him. Likewise, you also, watch that, reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. And so then he goes on to say these words in verses 14 through 17. He says these words. He says, for sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. Look at that. That's good news. Yeah. What then shall we sin because we are not under law, but under grace? He says, certainly not. So you don't have an excuse. You don't have a license to be sinning once God has reconciled you to himself. Yes, Lord. Now, you're going to fall short. Now, you're going to make some bad choices mm -hmm. and you're going to make some mistakes and you're going to do some wrong things at times. But that's why you have the gift of repentance. You can repent. Ask him to forgive you, and he loves you so much, he's going to constantly reconcile you to himself. Yeah, because yeah. why? Christ took all your sins, all yeah. your sins, past justification, present, present sanctification, ah. future glorification on him. Oh, yeah. So all your sins are already on him. So you don't have to keep taking it to the altar all the time. All you have to do, you know, I see people coming and crucifying him all the time. When we open up the doors of the church, the same people keep coming to him over and over again. I've seen that over and over again. Why do you keep crucifying him? You don't have to. He's already taken it for you. Yes, he has. He's already reconciled him to himself. So let me read these last two verses. Do you not know that to whom you present yourselves slaves to obey, that you are the ones, watch this, you are that one's slaves whom you obey, whether of sin leading to death or in obedience to leading to righteousness. But God, but God be thanked that through you, although you were slaves of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered, which is talking about just the good news of Jesus Christ. We, mm. we are reconciled. We are reconciled to God. The Christian faith bases everything on the extreme, self-confident nature of sin. Other faiths, watch this, and this is good. Other faiths don't deal with sins. The Bible alone is the only thing that deals with sin. The Bible alone deals with sin. The first thing Jesus Christ confronted in people was the hereditary of sin. He was talking about the nature of it. Mm -hmm. The 
And that's why I'm talking about the nature of reconciliation because he dealt with Nicodemus. Watch this. You all remember Nicodemus in John chapter 3, verse 3? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And it takes us right to Romans 3 mm. and verses 9 and 10. Let's look yes. at that. Romans chapter 3, mm -hmm. verses 9 and 10. And look at what it says. It says, what then? Are we better than they? Not at all. For we have previously charged both Jews and Greeks that they are all under sin, as it is written. There is none righteous, no, not one. So that's everybody that's in this building. That's everybody that's been born on this planet ever since Adam and Eve. And all the 7.5 billion or how many ever, I don't know where they get that number from, but how many ever people are on this planet, that includes everybody. everybody that's ever been born, that has died and gone on to be with the Lord or yes. wherever they are right now. Mm -hmm. And for those who are presently being born right now, I told you, for every baby that's being born around this world right now, there's babies being born in the hospitals around this 757 region right now. They are born into sin. They, nothing is righteous about them. Amen. And I know y'all want to say, but Pastor, you don't know what you're talking about. A baby ain't never did. Then the baby ain't never. Look, it says it right here. I, I'm standing on. I'm standing on the grounds of what God has said right here through Paul. The Holy Spirit inspired him. He says it right here. There is none righteous, no, not one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks after God, being independent from God. They have all turned aside. They have all together become unprofitable. There is none who does good. No, not one. I'll stop right there. He said there is none who does good. None. No, not one. None who does good. And so Jesus confronted Nicodemus in chapter 3 of John, uh, verse 3, about the hereditariness of sin. And it is because we have ignored this in our presentation of the gospel mm -hmm. that the message of the gospel has lost its sting and its explosive power. Amen. When we don't tell people <coughs> that they have come short of the glory of God and they have sinned, when we don't talk to them about the nature of what's going on with them, yeah. they cannot be reconciled to God. And that's why Amen. people are, you know, the church has lost its power. Amen. The church has lost its power. Why has the church lost its power? Because the church don't talk that's about right. sin anymore. That's right. The pastors want to get up behind the sacred desk and they want to tell people how good God want to be to them, how God want to bless them with a big house and how God want to bless them with money in the bank and yeah. fine education and how God want to bless them with good health and yeah. their family's doing good. And that's not the gospel. Come on, that's man. not the gospel. Come on, that's man. a benefit of his grace. Yeah. Don't get yeah. it twisted. Come on. When people come talking to you about God wants you to be blessed this way and that way. Well, he's already blessed you. Yes, when he, he woke you up this morning yeah. and put you in your Reckless. right mind, you was already blessed. That was the start of your blessing. But don't get it twisted about the blessings of God and the benefits of his grace. A good home, a good job, mm -hmm. a nice car to drive, good mm -hmm. education, those are benefits of his grace. Don't yes, get sir. it twisted. Amen. Benefits of his grace. That's what that is. Yeah. We're talking about salvation and redemption now. We're talking about people, you know, we're talking about people that are lost and on their way to hell. And they're close to the gate, as we can think of it. And we out here trying to tell people how good God is and how loving he is. But Deacon alluded to it. In order to understand his justice, mm. we got to go through some suffering. Mm. Got to suffer something. Amen. In order to understand his justice, we got to understand his love. Because it's weighed out like that. It balances yes, like that. Yes, sir. His, his, his love balances his justice. His yes. justice balances his love. Because he's holy. Yeah. And so I'm almost done. I just want to I just want to get to this nature of reconciliation. And so so we're missing, we're missing out by not really, you know, preaching the gospel and, and talking about uh, the real reason why people need to be born again. They need to be born again because they have this heredity 
called mm -hmm. sin. Sin. Sin nature. And we need to talk about it. And we mention it in our messages around here because we're not afraid of, we don't try to blatantly offend people. We don't go out trying to seek to hurt nobody, and that's not our job. Our job is to preach the good news. Our job is to bring the gospel and to present it the way that the Holy Spirit has given it to us. We're not to, we're not to shirk it and, and, and to be wondering if I should say this or not. All right. You should say it. All right. Because they need to hear it. Amen. Because somebody might need to hear it. Amen. Because God may be reconciling that person to himself. Yes, yes. So the revealed truth of the Bible is not that Jesus Christ took on himself our fleshly sins, but that he took on himself the hereditary of sin. Watch this, that no man can even touch. God made his own son to be sin that he might, watch this, make the sinner into a saint. Romans chapter 3, verse 20 and 25. It is revealed throughout the Bible that our Lord took on himself the sin of the world through identification with us. You can call Jones alluded to it. Not through sympathy for us, but to deliberately shoulder our sins and endure in his own body the complete culminative sin of the human race. And when you go on to Isaiah 53, verses 3 through 5 and 10, it shows you that he was acquainted with our suffering, our yes. pain, our grief. He was actually that suffering servant. Yes. And what it meant was he didn't suffer just physically because guess what? That was 800 years before he was even born or conceived. Yes. Isaiah already saw it. He was a forerunner for the Messiah. But he saw the suffering of sin. He mm -hmm. saw the suffering that sin would bring about to the human race. Amen. And see, God frees us up from that Thank suffering. You, so we suffer physically. Some of us suffer mentally. Some of us suffer emotionally. Some of us suffer in relationships. Some of us suffer financially. We suffer. But here, here Paul and, and Isaiah, uh, in uh, Isaiah uh, 53, they're talking about sin and what sin does. Wow. Sin makes the world <coughs> suffer. Yes, it does. Because sin is in people. Mm -hmm. Sin ain't in God's creatures. You know, it ain't in it ain't in the animals. It, sin ain't in the roach. I'll wait for the amen. They don't have a conscience. Sin ain't in the ant. Sin ain't in the giraffe. Now they're they're simple because the creation is. It, uh, Romans talks about the, the, the creation crying out, this moaning and groaning because of the sin that's in the universe. But they're not sinners as we are. Mm. The creation. Amen. A cockroach is not a sinner. 